Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canine Genetics 101 webinar presented by Cornell Rhiney Canine Health Center and Denmark Veterinary. My name is Rory Todd Hunter. I'm the director of the Cornell Richard P. Rhiney Canine Health Center. I'm a translational orthopedic researcher who practiced small animal orthopedic surgery. And my main interest has been in orthopedic genetics due to the number of lame dogs that I've seen in my clinical career. My collaborators and I use genomic tools to identify genetic markers and mutations contributing to complex tra orthopedic traits in dogs, especially hip and elbow dysplasia, rupture of the craniocruciate ligament or the ACL in humans, and leg calf PERS disease in small breed dogs. Our goal is to develop a toolkit of phenotypic and genetic strategies to identify breeding dogs with good orthopedic genetic quality to predict and prevent joint disease and hopefully develop novel therapies. I share two Chesapeake Bay Retrievers with my family. Uh, and of course, they adore my wife more than me. Uh, these are the ninth and 10th dogs we've shared in our household together. This webinar on medical genetics for dog owners, breeders, handlers, and veterinarians was created in collaboration with Embark. You wrote in well over 100 questions, so we can't answer every individual one uh, during this one hour seminar. We have structured this session with general introductory genetics first to try to get everyone on, on the same page as much as possible. And then we'll address as many of your questions as our time allows. All your questions though have been read more than once, which allows us to understand better what genetics questions you have so we can better develop educational resources to help support your breeding programs and practices and veterinary practices if there are veterinarians listening. And a bit of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar will be recorded and made available on demand after the event on the Cornell Rhiney Canon Health Center website and Embark's YouTube channel. Embark will also feature the, the video in a blog post on embarkvet.com. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. There are three of them. Uh, first of all, Dr. Jacqueline Evans, and you can see their names, I'm assuming, uh, in front of their faces on the screen. Jacqueline studied genetics for over 12 years. She's completed a PhD at Clemson University, where she developed a risk assessment for dermatomyositis in collies and Shetland sheepdogs. And then she was a postdoc at the NIH, where she identified genes associated with histiocytic sarcoma in flat-coated retrievers. Her research program focuses on improving the health of dogs by identifying genetic risk factors for complex diseases leading to genetic tests to reduce disease frequency, earlier disease detection, and potentially improve therapies. Many canine diseases have human counterparts, often caused by the same mutation or mutations in the same gene pathways. So the information that Jacqueline uh, and discoveries she can make, we can learn from the dog model, may also inform human disease research. Uh, next on the screen, you'll see Dr. Callum Donnelly, is a faculty member in the section of Theriogenology or Reproductive Medicine at Cornell. He's both a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists and Veterinary Internal Medicine. His clinical focus is maternal fetal medicine, helping to manage pregnancies and develop healthy offspring. Cal also holds a PhD in Integrative Pathobiology and leads a research program that uses next generation sequencing to address fundamental questions and clinical problems in reproductive health, pregnancy, and fetal development. And outside his professional career, Cal is an active member of the sporting dog community, training and testing his German long haired and German short hair pointers. And lastly, but not leastly, uh, veterinary geneticist at Embark Veterinary is Dr. Jenna Dottweiler. She's graduated from Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2014. She completed a small animal rotating internship at Wheatbridge Animal Hospital in 2015. In 2017, she finished a comparative theriogenology or reproduction medicine residency at Cornell and is a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists. She practiced small animal theriogenology in general practice for four years prior to joining Embark. And in her spare time, Jenna enjoys photography, hiking, competing in performance events and confirmation with her Welsh Winger Spaniels named Mason and Minnow. So, uh, we was, we're going to start off with some basic introductory uh, genetics uh, and the things we feel all breeders should know to effectively incorporate genetics into their breeding programs. 
So uh, I'm going to call uh, the panelists by their first names. I hope that's okay. So Jenna, what are some basic genetic terms all dog breeders should be aware of? Sure. And thank you for that lovely introduction, Dr. Todd Hunter. So some of these terms that I'm going to go over are going to be really, really basic for some of you, but I just want to make sure that I define all the words that you might hear us use throughout this presentation, just so that everyone can really walk away with a good understanding of genetics. So first, the gene is going to be our basic unit of inheritance. So dogs are going to have two copies of a gene at every genetic location. One of those is going to be inherited from the sire, while the other is going to be inherited from the dam. Next is the term allele. That just refers to the form of a gene, which could be wild type, which is the naturally occurring form of that gene in nature, or a variant or mutated form, which sometimes can lead to disease. And gene mutations also are responsible for different coat colors and types, as well as other physical characteristics. So mutations don't always necessarily lead to disease. And because dogs have two copies of each gene, they can be homozygous, meaning they have two identical copies at a particular genetic location, or heterozygous, meaning they have two different copies at a particular genetic location. Great. Uh, thanks, Jenna. Can you tell us something about the mode of inheritance and what, what that means? Sure, sure. Mode of inheritance just refers to how a genetic variant or mutation is passed down to the next generation. So you can also think of this as the number of copies of a mutated gene a dog is going to need to develop a disease or express a trait. So there are four main modes of inheritance that we think of for our more simple or monogenic, meaning one gene genetic conditions that we can see in our dogs. And those would be dominant. So we only need one copy of a variant to develop disease. Recessive, meaning we need two copies of a variant to develop disease. X-linked recessive, so because male animals are only going to have one X chromosome, males are only going to need one copy of the variant to develop disease, while females typically require two copies. And co-dominant, and this one is a little bit more complicated, but essentially no copies of a variant means no risk of developing disease as a result of that variant. One copy means either an intermediate severity or risk of disease, and two copies means a maximal severity or risk of disease. And so when you're running these genetic tests, those results are typically going to tell you whether or not your dog is at risk of developing a known genetic disease, or if they are a carrier for a recessive genetic disease, meaning they have one copy of that variant, but aren't expected to develop disease. Uh, that's great, Jenna. Uh how and how likely is it for a dog that tests at risk for a genetic disease to actually go on to show symptoms of that disease? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is it depends. So it depends on a few different factors, most notably penetrance and expression. So penetrance is re just referring to the proportion of individuals at risk for genetic disease that actually go on to develop the disease. So, for example, the progressive rod cone degeneration type of progressive retinal atrophy, which is abbreviated PRA, PRCD, has a nearly 100% penetrance, meaning that essentially every dog with two copies of that recessive allele is going to go on to experience some degree of vision loss. But other genetic diseases are not so clear cut. So an at-risk designation on a genetic test doesn't necessarily mean that that dog is going to go on to develop disease. So variable expression then refers to the different symptoms that you might see in dogs affected by the same genetic condition. So for example, if we have two golden retrievers, both affected by ichthyosis, which is a genetic disease that causes kind of flaky, scaly skin, they could have really different symptoms. So some dogs are going to experience really severe scaling of their skin that's really minimally responsive to therapy, and other dogs experience very, very mild symptoms. And all of these concepts, again, mostly apply to our simple or one gene genetic conditions. So many diseases are controlled by multiple genetic mutations or could be the result of interaction of a dog's genetics with its environment. So those are going to be referred to as polygenic, meaning many genes and complex or multifactorial diseases. And unfortunately, those are not going to be easily genetically tested at this time. Hey, thank you. So, Cal, why should breeders care about genetics in their breeding programs? And how does genetic testing fit into all the other testing that 
uh, they're going to be doing uh, to ensure best practices uh, in their breeding program and that, that are going to be recommended to them? Thanks, Rory. That's a really great question. And I think for the attendees, if you're here, you're probably interested in responsible breeding practices, which is a great thing. Uh, ultimately, when we're making the decision to breed a certain individual, a lot of us are going to start with a list of things that though we want that individual to meet. And for a lot of breeders, that's going to start with their intention. So this might be desirable physical traits if you're someone in more focused on the show ring. Uh, if you're someone more like me, you might be interested in cultivating some uh, certain performance traits. It doesn't really matter what sport you're involved in. I think the thing that unifies responsible breeders is that they're probably also selecting for a temperament and health. Uh, many of you are going to be used to doing your health screening to qualify an animal for breeding, whether that's hip x-rays or an eye exam, echocardiogram, and there's a whole myriad of things that we do to test animals for health. We really want to make sure that we're breeding from those healthiest animals. However, as Jenna has alluded to, some of those traits are not expressed in an individual and they're carried. And so genetic testing allows us to have that deeper level of understanding about our, uh, our animals and our dogs. Um, and it really enables a more informed breeding decision. And so at one end, we can be using genetics to help manage carrier states. And again, Jenna's giving some really good examples of those. Uh, and at the other end, and something that um, Jenna and Jacqueline will talk about further is how using genetic tests is important for maintaining genetic diversity. And so I would encourage everyone that here that is a breeder to think of genetic testing as another box that you really should be ticking on your journey towards producing healthy puppies. Okay, thanks, Cal. Uh, now back to Jenna. Uh, Jenna, what do you feel are the basic principles that every breeder should know about in order to be effective in incorporating genetic testing results that Cal was talking about into their breeding program? Sure, sure. So when we're looking at our simple or monogenic test results, the breed of dog, what variant we're talking about, and that variant's mode of inheritance all really need to be taken into consideration when we're deciding how to incorporate that result into a breeding program. And that's because certain genetic variants are expected to increase risk of disease in certain breeds or populations, but then not in others. So in those cases, breeding decisions really shouldn't be made on the presence or absence of that genetic variant alone. Other variants are going to be seen at a really high rate in certain breeds, so eliminating them completely and suddenly from a population could result in a really precipitous loss of genetic diversity, as Cal mentioned. So in other instances where disease-associated variants are fixed within a population, meaning that every member of that population has two copies of a specific variant, elimination is going to be impossible without some kind of an outcrossing program to other breeds that don't have that variant. Another thing to consider is we want to think about that variant's effect on overall health and the availability of a prevention or treatment strategy as well in both of those cases. So just kind of speaking in generalities, when we're looking at our recessive, non-fixed diseases, generally speaking, we should not breed two carriers to one another. Doing so is going to result in about 25% of that litter inheriting two copies of the variant, which of course would put them at risk for that associated condition. But carriers of recessive variants can and should be bred to normal individuals because that mating is going to help preserve genetic diversity, and it's not going to result in disease in any of the offspring. And taking that even one step further, an individual that is actually affected by a recessive condition may also be bred to an individual with two normal copies of that gene. Sometimes we call those clear provided that they're otherwise a good breeding candidate and that we don't expect breeding to exacerbate their condition in any way. So all puppies resulting from that pairing would be carriers of that condition, but would not show signs of disease themselves. And then for our dominant and our co-dominant variants, individuals with one or two copies ideally shouldn't be bred. Instead, we like to use a first order relative that does not possess the disease associated variant if they are available. But if breeding these individuals is necessary to maintain our genetic diversity within a population, they should be replaced by normal offspring when that becomes possible. 
And then lastly, for our X-linked variants, normal males can definitely be bred. They can't pass on that variant associated with those diseases, but known carrier females should ideally not be bred as half of their male offspring would be at risk. That's great information, Jenna. Thank you. Uh, we had a lot of questions about incorporating genetic health results while keeping genetic diversity in mind. Would you mind touching on this topic as well? Yeah, absolutely. It's come up a few times already. And genetic diversity is, of course, a really important factor to consider when you're deciding which dogs to breed, especially in our breeds with smaller gene pools. So to start, for anyone who may not be familiar, the coefficient of inbreeding, which is abbreviated COI, is defined as the likelihood of inheriting two identical alleles from each parent. So that's typically going to be expressed as a percentage, and it does represent the level of inbreeding in an individual. So the COI of an individual is going to increase with increased relatedness of its parents. And I do like to remind folks that some degree of inbreeding is actually necessary to maintain the desirable, consistent characteristics and traits of a breed. So it's not all bad. There's a few different ways to actually measure our COI. It can be estimated by using pedigree analysis or by some genomic measurements. So our pedigree-based COIs depend really, really heavily on record-keeping accuracy. They usually go back three, five, maybe 10 generations. And these pedigree-based COIs can deviate really substantially from our genomic-based COIs because they're going to assume that 50% of DNA in any given offspring comes from each parent. That's not going to be entirely true in biology due to phenomenons called recombination and segregation. And in fact, full siblings can have pretty different COIs because although they each inherit 50% of each parent's DNA, it's not always the same exact 50%. So only identical twins are going to share the exact same DNA and therefore the exact same COI. Also important to consider that founding members of the breed were often related to one another themselves, which a pedigree-based COI is just not going to take into account. So then why do we care if we need some inbreeding to maintain our breed characteristics? And we care because of a phenomenon called inbreeding depression. And that's just the term for the reduced biologic fitness in the offspring of related individuals. So in the dog, reduced fertility, shortened lifespan, reduced puppy survival, and increased disease prevalence have all been associated with an increased measure of inbreeding. So then what do we do about it? So average COI is going to vary really greatly depending on breed. So there really is no one size fits all approach to maximize genetic diversity within a population. And I know that is very frustrating. I wish that there was one number that I could tell you to shoot for to minimize those effects of inbreeding depression, but it varies so much by breed. However, there are some general strategies that we can employ to maintain genetic diversity within our population. So first, it's important to know what COI you're actually dealing with in your breed. For this purpose, I'd recommend a genomic measure, as I mentioned before. But whether you're using a genomic or a pedigree-based COI, you should be able to use that information to estimate the COI of offspring of a particular pairing. Because the COI of the offspring depends on how related the parents are to one another, not how inbred they each are. So even two parents with high COIs could potentially produce puppies with lower COIs if they are not closely related. So we can't just automatically exclude inbred individuals with our, from our breeding program. It's really, really important to actually calculate out the COIs that you might expect in the puppies to see if you're headed in that right direction. Second, it's important to maintain carriers of recessive diseases within that population. Again, those dogs aren't going to show signs of that associated genetic disease, and they can be bred smartly to avoid producing at-risk puppies like we mentioned earlier. And we did actually have one specific question submitted about how to eliminate carriers of recessive diseases from a population while maintaining diversity. And really, anytime we eliminate individuals from the gene pool, we do have the potential to inadvertently narrow that gene pool and kind of accidentally select for different diseases or traits, which we may not be able to test for. So generally speaking, it's a lot better to maintain carriers of known genetic conditions within your gene pool because these individuals can be tested and bred responsibly. 
And then lastly, another common pitfall to avoid is going to be popular sire syndrome. This is where one sire is really overly used within a population that's going to decrease diversity. So especially in our rare breeds, we should really consider utilizing all of our healthy, stable temperament individuals so that we can help maintain that diversity. Wow, that's a lot of information. Thank you. Uh, so Jacqueline, uh, how do I know that a genetic test result is accurate? Sure. So ideally, the genotype result is going to be really accurate from genetic testing. So this is part of the validation process that the company is going to do to make sure they're producing really accurate results. Um, and so for diseases that have a simple mode of inheritance, um, as Jenna has been discussing, in that case, the genotype is going to pretty, pretty accurately reflect um, the dog's phenotype or whether or not they should have the disease. Um, so this is the case for recessive diseases where an individual needs to have those two copies of the mutation in order to show the disease, um, with one copy being inherited from mom and the other from dad. But for these more complex diseases like cancers or autoimmune diseases, for example, here we have not only genetic risk factors, in many cases, multiple genetic risk factors, um, but also environmental components. And so in this case, um, when we are able to develop genetic tests, these are really more um, risk assessments where we can get a handle on specific genotype combinations that could give a dog um, a low risk of developing the disease in their lifetime, um, a moderate risk, maybe about 40 to 50% of dogs with those genotypes could get the disease, and then up to very high risk where we're thinking about kind of 90 to 100%. Um, and so these are not guarantees. Um, because there are these other variables um, like the environmental components. But it's also really important to note that the genetic test results are never going to be diagnostic for the disease. You still need that clinical diagnosis um, to be confident. Thank you. So Jenna, can you explain the benefits of running a panel rather than just breed-specific tests? What is a panel or a multi-market test versus a breed-specific test? Sure. So a genetic testing panel is able to screen dogs for a lot of different genetic mutations all at once. So usually one cheek swab or one blood draw can offer information on hundreds of different diseases and traits that are known to affect a really wide variety of different breeds. Whereas breed specific testing generally is just going to return results only for diseases or traits that are known to affect a certain breed. So because certain diseases may have only been seen in one particular breed, it might seem a little bit silly to run a full panel of tests, but in some cases, a panel test can save you some money if there are a lot of known genetic conditions in your breed. And in other cases, genetic diseases that were thought to only affect one breed might pop up in others. And my own breed, which is the Welsh Springer Spaniel, does have a good example of this. So autosomal recessive hereditary nephropathy is a recessive genetic disease. It causes symptoms of kidney failure to appear usually between about the ages of six months and two years. And initially that genetic disease was thought only to affect the Cocker Spaniel. This is a pretty bad disease. Affected dogs usually do unfortunately pass away within about a year of diagnosis. But panel tests run on Welshies did find that this allele does occur in certain lines of our breed and it has led to disease in our breeds. So it doesn't come up frequently. It's not a massive problem. We don't need to panic as a breed community, but knowing this information does allow us to make smart breeding decisions to avoid producing puppies at risk for this condition. And truly, we never would have known to look for it were it not for the panel testing. Right. That's great advice, great help. Uh, so Jenna, uh, when should I test my dogs? And when does testing every puppy in my litter versus only breeding dogs matter? So our germline or inherited genetic testing can really be performed at any time, any age, because the dog's genetic makeup is not going to change as it ages. It's generally easier to test when puppies are a little bit older and can be safely separated from their mom. So we usually say at least two weeks of age. And really, it's most simple when they're fully weaned, which usually happens between six and eight weeks of age or so. And then why might you test puppies within a litter rather than just the parents? That could be beneficial for a few reasons. So first, if more than one sire may have fathered that litter, DNA testing is going to be able to determine which pup puppy belongs to which sire. Second, testing is going to be able to identify which puppies are carriers of genetic diseases or certain color traits that we may be shooting for. 
And lastly, if the mating does have the potential to produce puppies at risk for genetic diseases, knowing this information early on in that puppy's life might provide more options for management and may actually improve that puppy's outcome. Hey, uh, so back to Jacqueline. Uh, how and why do we undertake genetic research and why is genetic research important? So we're undertaking genetic research in order to really get a sense of how a hereditary disease is developing um, and why this is a, a problem in our breed. So the goal is always to find a specific mutation or it could be multiple mutations for a more complex disorder. And we want to know which of these variants are really driving that disease and causing it. Um, and so once we know this, that's when we can develop a genetic test and we can start carefully breeding away from the disease over time. Um, to reduce the number of affected individuals, but also to maintain that genetic diversity as we go. Um, and so we can also use genetic testing, not just for breeding decisions, but also to identify dogs that may be at high risk of developing a later onset disease in their lifetime, such as cancer. And so with this information, we can start screening for the disease earlier on. Um, in some cases, we might be able to take some preventative measures or be able to catch the disease and begin treatment earlier. Um, and this can sometimes result in a better prognosis. Um, and ultimately, a lot of times we might not really understand the, the, real, the mechanisms that are underlying the disease. And so maybe we don't have any good treatment options because we don't know what those are. Um, but if we can understand what are the genes, um, what are the pathways that are affecting this disease, we might be able to identify new treatments um, that we could uh, research and we could we could try these out. And so how we perform the research is really depending on our mode of inheritance that we've been talking about. So for simple diseases, we can solve these with much smaller numbers of individuals um, and a more straightforward analysis of the DNA. Um, for complex diseases, that's where we start really needing to do um, these studies that you may have heard about, which are genome-wide association studies. Um, and so here the the basic premise is that we're collecting DNA samples from a population of dogs who have the disease that we're interested in. And then we're comparing to um, the DNA of a group of healthy dogs. And it's sort of looking for that needle in the haystack of what's really the, the one or a few differences between these two groups. And that kind of highlights where we need to look in the DNA sequence to find those specific mutations. Fantastic. Okay, so this is perfect timing. We're about half an hour in, and uh, this has been a great um, opening introduction. So next, we'd like to address some registrants submitted questions, and thank you, everyone, who've been asking insightful questions. And because we received so many, as I said, we can't address everyone, uh, but we, we try to sort of group them together and um, address as many as we can uh, in the half hour or so we have left. And we had a lot of questions about uh, coat color and uh, sort of morphologic or form characteristics. Um, and because it's a clear topic of interest, both of these together, we can potentially do another webinar later on to address coat color. Uh, but we're going to start with Jacqueline. And uh, although I just mentioned we're not going to be covering coat color in this webinar, we are going to talk about one specific uh, coat color issue, and that is the Merle and its idiosyncrasies in breeding. And uh, Jacqueline's going to expand on that a little bit. Sure. So we had a lot of questions about Merle specifically. Um, and so, so just so everyone knows, Merle is a particular coat pattern. Um, and so it's characterized by these uh, patches of full pigmentation on a more dilute coat color background. Um, we see this in certain dog breeds, um, a lot of times herding breeds like Aussies and Shel Shelties and Collies. Um, among others. And so for a black dog, this is going to look like um, a dark black patch on a gray background. And so how do we get this coat pattern? Um, this is a case where you need to have to be heterozygous. So all the Merle dogs have one copy of the Merle allele, um, which is the version of the gene that has the Merle mutation on it. And then they have one wild type or normal copy um, of that gene. And so if you inherit two copies of the Merle mutation, this is where you can um, have what's known as double Merle. And so in this case, the dog is probably gonna have a mostly white coat. 
And you can start to have problems where they might have um, deafness or blindness. And so that's because the pigmentation that we're seeing in the, the coat pattern um, is actually also really important for normal hearing um, and normal eye development. So breeders are avoiding matings of two merle dogs in order to not produce the double merles. Um, and so where all of this gets a little bit trickier is the merle mutation itself um, includes this really long DNA sequence that's very repetitive. It's the same sequence all in a row. Um, and so your cells actually have a hard time replicating this faithfully. So between generations, you can end up losing some of that repetitive sequence, or you could expand and gain some of it, um, just because it's really challenging to exactly uh, repeat all these bases in a row. Um, and so some dogs carry what's known as a cryptic merle allele. So this is where they have a short enough version of that repeat um, that the cells are actually able to produce normal copies of the gene. They can kind of work around the mutation and you end up with a dog that looks totally solid and normal. Um, but because this sequence is so unstable, if you were to breed a dog with a cryptic merle allele to say a standard merle, it's possible that you could have an expansion of that cryptic allele in the next generation, and you might be able to produce a double merle. Um, so in general, it's best that um, dogs with merle alleles are bred to dogs without any copy of the merle allele. Well, um, I'm glad you explained that because I wouldn't be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, Jenna, uh, we've had several questions submitted on the genetics of intervertebral disc disease or IVDD. Can you give us a brief overview of this topic, please? Sure, sure. It's certainly a hot topic. So the FGF4 retrogene variant on chromosome 12 is also what's going to be known as the chondrodystrophy or CDDY and intervertebral disc disease or IVDD variant. So this specific variant is kind of a two-parter, so it leads to both chondrodystrophy and increases the risk of IVDD. So for both of those kind of halves, only one copy of the variant is needed to increase risk. So it is inherited in a dominant fashion. So chondrodystrophy is going to be our physical trait that's been selected for on purpose in many breeds. It includes that short-legged, long-bodied appearance. And in fact, it's the breed standard for a lot of our breeds like dachshunds, corgis. We want them to be long and low. So chondrodystrophy can be caused by this variant by itself or other variants alone or in combination with this one. So there are multiple variants that can cause a similar appearance. So type 1 IVDD then, which is also known as a slipped disc, is a medical condition of the intervertebral disc. So that normally serves as a little cushion between the bones in a dog's spine. So this condition occurs when rupture of the soft center part of the disc occurs through tears in the outer fibrous part of the disc. So that leads to compression of the spinal cord. So symptoms of this condition can range from mild back pain all the way to complete paralysis of the hind or all four limbs. It just depends on how much and where that spinal cord is compressed. And similarly, treatment can consist of rest and pain medications all the way up to surgical decompression of that spinal cord, just depending on the severity that we're dealing with. This variant is known to increase the risk of type 1 IVDD. It's very, very likely that there are other genetic, environmental, lifestyle factors that can also contribute to the overall risk for this disease. And it's also worth mentioning that there are different types of intervertebral disc disease in dogs, and this variant only increases the risk of type 1. So we had a lot of folks write in asking about the likelihood of their dog developing IBDD when they possess one or two copies of this variant. So first, there's no known increased risk for dogs that have two copies versus those who only have one. So in other words, dogs with one or two copies are both going to be at the same level of increased risk. And next, this is actively being researched about how the risk of IVDD due to this variant varies within and among dog breeds. 
but really we don't have the data available yet to properly predict that lifetime risk. So there is one study that did investigate IVDD risk in multiple breeds and mixes, and it was found dogs with at least one copy of the variant are between five and 15 times more likely to undergo surgery for IVDD compared to dogs of the same breed with no copies. And then to complicate matters even further, many breeds do have a really high frequency or are essentially fixed for this variant. So again, that means all dogs within that breed population have at least one copy of that variant. So in those cases, we're really not able to use this genetic result alone to determine the likelihood of developing IVDD or to make breeding decisions based on it. So this is the case in the French Bulldog, as well as many other popular breeds, and in these breeds, we need to consider other things when we're deciding who to breed. So results of other health testing and especially presence or absence of back issues in that individual or in the family line. Uh, thanks, Jenna. That's great. So, Cal, many members of the audience would like to know more about cryptorchidism. Can you discuss this condition and explain where we are with genetically testing for the condition? Thanks, Rory. Um, I think a lot of dog breeders would have come across the crypto orchid dog if they've been in the game for a while. And so it's the most common um, disorder of sexual development in dogs. And what crypto orchidism means is a failure of the testes to descend into the scrotum. And for many species, this process happens before birth, but in dogs, some of it is completed after birth. So in puppies, testes really should be present in the scrotum by around eight weeks of age. And that's pretty convenient because it's also around the time that you should be having your puppies looked over before they go to their new homes. Um, descent of the testis is a really complex process, and it means that that testy has to migrate across the abdomen, through the inguinal canal, and into the scrotum. And in order for that to happen normally, there's a number of steps. Uh, and this also means that there's an awful number of opportunities for missteps, and these ultimately lead to cryptorchidism. Um, there's a lot of suspicion around um, cryptorchidism having a genetic component as it tends to occur more frequently in some breeds and in some lines within breeds. There's been some targeted investigations, and by targeted, I mean breed specific, um, but as yet, there's no real slam dunk variant that would be predictive of this disease um, in uh, progeny. Um, what we do know that across breeds, size is highly associated with the um, condition. And so smaller dogs tend to have a higher incidence of the condition than larger breed dogs outside of a few certain you know, breed exceptions. And so uh, recently, a specific kind of cryptorchidism called inguinal cryptorchidism, which essentially means it almost got all the way but didn't quite make it, um, has been associated with a specific gene, HMGA2. Uh, this gene is also associated with adult size, and so it sort of helps confirm that relationship between smaller dogs and the risk of cryptorchidism. Uh, in addition to sort of the physical traits, why do we really care about cryptorchidism? The main two reasons we care, one, it can affect fertility, but more importantly, it can be um, a risk for that dog because those testes, if retained, are at high risk of um, tumor formation as the dog ages. And so Really, at this time, before we have um, genetic tests uh, per breed or across breeds, uh, the best thing that breeders can do is to ensure that at your puppy health exams, um, close attention is paid to the um, presence of uh, two scrotal testes. Thanks, Carl. So, Jacqueline, many breeders asked about which specific tests are best for their breed. So, can you provide an overview of how to find this information? Sure, there are a couple of quick references. Um, so the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals or the OFA, they have a browse by breed function on their website. And so this shows the health and genetic testing that are recommended or available for your individual breed. Um, the Embark webpage also has a search function by breed. And so that'll give you a list of the tests that are on their panel that could be relevant for your breed. Um, and so in general, you wanna test for common problems um, that are an issue for your breed or those that you've specifically encountered um, in your breeding lines. And so in some cases that might be best accomplished by single gene testing and in others you could get that information through a panel test as well. Hey, 
Uh, back to Jenna. Uh, Jenna, many people would like to know more about the ALT test performed through Embark and how to apply those results to a breeding program. Can you expand on this a bit more, please? Sure, sure. So just to give some background for anybody who may not be familiar, Embark scientists did discover a variant in the GPT gene that's associated with low alanine aminotransferase or ALT activity. So ALT is a liver enzyme that's really commonly measured in the blood of dogs to assess liver health. So dogs with one or two copies of this variant show reduced ALT activity meaning that their ALT level may not increase beyond the published reference range, even in the face of liver damage. So having this result in your dog does not indicate that they have liver disease, nor does this result provide any kind of an ALT level. And because this variant does not predispose to any liver disease, it does not need to be considered when we're deciding which dogs to breed. This test is just a tool used by veterinarians to offer some more personalized care to their patients. So the only thing with these guys is that we do recommend dogs with this variant do have their baseline ALT level assessed while they are healthy. So like on wellness labs or before a dental procedure. So the increases in that value just can just be interpreted a little bit more easily if they do go on to develop liver disease in the future. Thank you, Jenna. So Cal, uh, there's a lot of interest, of course, among uh people and uh, dog owners and um, all sorts of species about cancer um, of the lifetime of their pets. So uh, is there any genetic, any genetic testing available for cancer at this time? Thanks, Ray. I think that's a really good topic to hit on. And I think um, what I'd like to say is that dogs are really good at teaching us a lot. And one of those things that they're unfortunately good at teaching us a lot about is, is cancer. And because dogs share our homes um, and a lot of what a dog is made up of also makes up uh, us as far as genetics are concerned, um, they have a lot to teach us about cancer. And so while we know that there are breeds that have certain predispositions to cancer, the genetics of cancer are a little bit more complex. And so outside of a few certain examples, there aren't always good uh, marker genes to say that an individual is gonna be um, more or less susceptible. And that's because cancer oftentimes is very specific to an individual. But if we look at that as a silver lining, it also means that that individual animal's genome holds a wealth of information for how to tackle that cancer. And this is what Jenna is talking about as sort of personalized approach. And so we call this personalized or precision medicine. So personalized medicine is where we take um, or, or make specific treatment um, recommendations about the individual animal's um, genome and we can tailor treatments to that genome. Uh, precision medicine is kind of a level back where we're comparing genomes of animals with a similar disease, but also making more informed decisions about those treatments um, based on their genetics. And uh, this kind of genomic in hand, uh, informed medicine is already available for dogs with cancer. And so while we still have a little good bit of you know, work to do as far as using genetics to prevent cancer, um, we are really a huge advantage today by harnessing a dog's own genes to improve its treatment outcomes. Um, you can also really help future dogs too. And so there are a number of large studies uh, looking at dog lifestyles and their genomes and how these relate to the development of diseases. And one that I think we'd like to highlight is the Dog Aging Project. And so in that project, they're cataloging the genetics of dogs, their environmental risk factors, and how those dogs change as they age. And so really, you know, harnessing those genomic tools to make really um, informed decisions about health. And what that helps with is it produces a large amount of data that we can go back and look at and compare between populations and helps really make accurate predictions. And so if you're thinking of a way that, you know, you want to be involved with um, genetics research or genomics research, or, you know, indeed, if one of your own patient, the pets, unfortunately, has cancer, participation in these, you know, large studies is a really, really good way of, um, you know, helping out the whole dog community and um, advancing genomic medicine. Thanks very much, Cal. So, uh, Jacqueline, uh, several breeders asked about genetically testing for cleft palates and epilepsy. Uh, I know these are two quite diverse problems, but can you discuss these two conditions briefly and, uh, and the availability of genetic testing for each, please? 
Right. So there are some risk mutations that have been identified through studies in specific breeds for cleft palate and epilepsy. Um, and so if a breed specific test is available, this could be used to identify dogs at high risk, like we've been talking about. Um, so this is true in the case of the Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. Um, because they've identified the mutation that causes at least the most common form of cleft palate within the breed. But without validating each test in all the other breeds, we can't be sure whether the results would apply beyond the tollers, for example. Um, and there are multiple ongoing studies that I'm aware of for seizures. Um, and so this includes epilepsy in Belgian Shepherd breeds out of um, Dr. Anita Oberbauer's lab at UC Davis. I'm also aware of a border collie collapse study at the University of Minnesota. Um, and so these more complex problems generally take a lot longer and more samples um, to identify solutions for. Um, and so epilepsy is certainly a complex genetic trait. There are definitely environmental components. There's multiple different types um, of seizures. And so it's definitely a case where um, you could have healthy parents that are carrying some risk alleles for epilepsy that could be passed on to their offspring. Um, we did have a question about that. And unfortunately for most causes of epilepsy, um, we still don't have a great way to test for those genetically. Thanks, uh, Jacqueline. So Jenna, um, we've had several questions about the addition of new tests to Embark's platform. Can you explain how and when new tests are added, please? Sure. So in order for us to be able to offer a test for a specific condition, the causative mutation for that disease must have been identified. So either by our internal research or it may have been published in an external journal. And for those mutations discovered by external researchers, the mutation must then be validated internally or by other researchers before it can be offered on our testing platform. So generally speaking, we do update our platform about yearly to include new tests for genetic mutations that have recently been published or validated. All right. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to just spend uh, or offer the panelists a little bit of time now to talk about uh, their own genetic research. Um, and one of the reasons for that is to, that some of the listeners might be able to help them to discover something new. So. Uh, Jacqueline, how about you start, um, and then we'll move on to Jenna and Cal. Thanks. Thanks, Rory. Um, so my lab is currently working on PANIS, which is also known as chronic superficial keratitis. And so this is an immune-related eye disease, um, which can lead to blindness in some cases. It's especially common in German Shepherd dogs compared to other breeds. And so this is often one of our first clues that there could be um, genetic mutations within the breed that can increase an individual's risk of developing the disease in their lifetime. Um, and so we're performing a genetic study to identify these mutations. We're also looking at gastric cancer, um, which is more common in Belgian shepherd dogs, um, like the Turvurin and sheepdog. And we're studying gingival enlargement in boxers as well. Um, and so to do these studies, we really rely on owners to contact us and send in DNA samples. So we can do blood samples or cheek swabs that come into our lab. Blood is really ideal um, for long-term purposes, so it yields higher quality DNA and more of the DNA. Um, and so this is great because sometimes these more complex problems require a lot of DNA um, by the time we get to the end of them. And also that allows us to archive the DNA. And so we could use that um, in a future project within the same breed. Thanks very much, All right? So if anybody can help uh, Jacqueline, uh, please contact her. And now you, Jenna, you're in the private sector. Um, uh, can you tell us about um, what you and Embark might be doing, please? Sure, sure. So first, I'd just like to take a quick moment to remind anyone who may be listening with an Embark tested dog to go ahead and complete that health survey located on their profile each year. That health information is really vitally important to direct our research initiatives. And one of our past initiatives really does highlight the importance of this type of collaboration between dog owners and geneticists to discover some new genetic mutations. So early onset adult deafness is a really important health concern in the Rhodesian Ridgeback. 
And UC Davis discovered that there was a connection between that condition and chromosome 18 back in 2009. But it wasn't until Embark teamed up with the Rhodesian Ridgeback Club of the United States, the nonprofit Project Dog, and Rhodesian Ridgeback Dog Owners. At that point, we were able to perform a genome-wide association study, like Jacqueline said earlier, using our Embark genotyping platform. So that analysis located that genetic association of early onset adult deafness to a specific gene, and further DNA sequencing and genotyping did identify a recessive mutation that is perfectly predictive of this disorder. So we're now able to offer this test and improve the lives of Ridgebacks and their owners, which of course would not have been possible without this collaboration. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and Kel, uh, what are you most interested in, please? Um, I may be a little bit the odd one out here because I mostly work in uh, horse and cattle genetics, but my interest in training is really in precision medicine. So I'm very happy to talk to anyone about how we can try and bring um, genomic tools into clinical practice. And in my own practice, that really um, extends to reproductive medicine, reproductive physiology, pregnancy, and fetal development. Um, so from my clinical standpoint, I'm having a big interest in um how we manage um, pregnancies, um, we're developing some genomic tools so that we can sequence the DNA of a developing fetus from the maternal plasma. And the way that this happens is that there's the placenta is developing, it sheds a few cells into the maternal circulation, and we're able to pick up on those signals. And so we can use this to diagnose um, uh, pregnancy conditions, and it gives us an idea about what constitutes healthy genomics in a pregnancy, and then also how we can use that to make um, you know, clinical decisions in times where we uh, have uh, problem pregnancies. And one that we've been seeing a lot with our dogs is uh, pregnancies that maybe are maintaining their progesterone concentration. And so using these kind of techniques is, is a potential tool for uh, studying those. And so at the moment, we're mostly interested in uh, cattle and horses, but we're really hoping to extend that to other species in the future as we um, get our lab up and going. Great. Thanks very much. If you had more time, I'd probe these uh, panelists a bit further on their research and sort of try and understand um, how if, if it can also help uh, human health. But maybe one day we can do sort of a one medicine seminar and, and see how we go with that. So um, we're coming toward the end uh, of the, the uh, panelists' time in the seminar. So I'd like to extend my thanks to the panelists and give them a round of applause and everyone behind the scenes who helped create this webinar. We hope you've enjoyed it. Many thanks to all of you for sending questions after the the, uh, the Wine Country Dog Show in upstate New York and for registering for the uh, seminar. Uh, besides funding canine research um, in the college, the Rhiney Canine Health Centers, other goal is to help all dogs be healthier. If it means being born healthy, staying healthy and living long, healthy lives. So please spread the word. Visit the Embark and the Rhiney Canon Health Center websites, offer suggestions for what you find useful and about which you'd like more information. I've only been director for a few months and I have a lot to learn about the external face of my job. This is a start to understand what breeders, owners of veterinarians think are high priorities in canine health. So um, thank you all again and um, uh, hopefully we'll see you in the future and good luck with your dog breeding and uh, dog handling and the interaction of you and uh, your dogs, because that's what we're all about. So thanks, everybody.